I'm here, Sean. Thank you very much. And welcome to everybody to this morning's discussion. We're going to be looking at Giza installations with SANS 10254. And what we're going to be going through is why, first of all, there is a need for a regulation like this. And then we'll go through and look at some of the changes in SANS and what that has, uh, what that now says in the new 2017 edition. So first of all, then why? Why would we need a regulation on Giza installations? Well, it's all about safety and water conservation. Back in the 1960s, when we started pressurizing hot water cylinders, because before that we had gravity feed tanks and it was basically an open vent system. But as soon as they want to make it now a pressure vessel, Department of Labor said, but now there are certain rules and regulations that have to come in. It's got to be inspected every two years and pressure tests have to be done and that type of thing. And we knew that industry is not going to go and inspect a geese every two years and do a pressure test and that type of thing. So we had to put certain measures in place to make sure that it was going to be safe and stay safe. So then in 2001, the Government Gazette came out, and you will see a copy of it appearing on your screen there shortly. And that said that by 2003, this had to now be in place. And we see point number 14 there. It says to us that every consumer installation must comply with SABS 0254 and SABS 0252. Now, the numbering has changed a little bit since then. It is now SANS, S-A-N-S, 10254 and S-A-N-S, 10252. And 0252, the one that we look at, obviously, is part one for the water supply and so forth. But the one we're looking at is SANS 10254 today. Just make sure that when you have your SANS copy, that it is the latest one. You'll see a copy on your screens there. It's SANS 10254 of 2017, edition 4.1. And we see that it's not just for Giza installations. It says for the installation, maintenance, replacement, and repair of fixed electric storage water heating systems. So if before 2003, a Giza had been installed, and obviously it did not does not comply to the standards as it is today. When we do maintenance and replacement or fixing on it, we are expected to fix that installation. We see a lot of cases of geysers being very, very dangerous. Now, it may not be something that you have seen yourselves yet, but regularly there are cases on your screen you'll see a picture this is one that happened in Hanijiu where it actually blew the outside three walls away the roof dropped down and that wall that you still see standing there it actually pushed into the building by about 70 millimeters and this was a copper geyser so low pressure so we believe that it's only high pressure that explodes geysers it's not any geyser can explode because it's the superheating of the water that makes it explode, not the pressure so much. So we have to abide by these regulations. So let's then, without further ado, have a look at some of these regulations that we need to have a look at. So now we know that all installations have to be designed by the architects and engineers that are drawing up the plans for the building that is going up. But you guys will know, you get to site and it is not always possible to plumb exactly like the engineers thought it was going to happen. Previously, we used to be able to just say, oh, well, we qualified plumbers, we'll just change the design a little bit and we'll reroute it and we'll do it our way. We can't anymore. SANS 10254 yet tells us in point 4.1.1.2, point 
where some of the provisions of the standard cannot be applied, the installation shall comply with the details given in a rational design developed by a who? A registered professional engineer on accepted installation drawings. So we can't just go to any engineer or water services engineer and get them to just do a little sketch for us on the back of a cigarette packet or something like that. It's got to be on accepted installation drawings. And they can't just do what they want either because it continues and says, such rational design shall not compromise the safety and performance principles in the standard. So they're also limited to very much what they can change on that rational design. So if there's a problem on site, you have to deviate from the drawings, make sure you get a registered professional engineer to do it on drawings there. The next point we're going to look at is 4.1.1.4 and that is the first time now that a law has called for a certificate of compliance and it says that on completion of the installation a certificate of compliance from the professional body for plumbers registered in terms of the relevant national standards. So we know that that is the Plumbing Industry Registration Board. So you need to issue a COC lodged with the PIRB on all geyser installations, maintenance, repair, everything, over 1,500 Rand. Now we know that most times we go out to a geyser, even if it's just to replace a pressure valve, it's going to be about that price. So. Put it into your mind that all geyser installations, you have to go and give a COC. Then in 4.3.3, .3, it is on hot and cold water delivery pressure. And there it says that the various components of the system shall be so installed that the hot and cold water delivery pressure to mixing points is balanced. Now, I've had it quite often where people say, but I don't have a mixer in the house, I don't need to balance it. And then the first question I ask them is, do you have a shower? Because even if it's a shower with two separate stop taps, it is classified as a mixer because the water is reaching a mixing point before it reaches the terminal place, namely the shower rows. And most of our shower roses these days are flow restricted. And so it causes a lot of back pressure if that is unbalanced. So on the drawing taken from SANS 10254, you can see there, it shows that your pressure reducing valve must be on the line before the hot and cold water split to the various points in the house. So you would take your garden taps off before that because you want them on your high pressure side. But after that, the hot and cold water must be balanced. But then if we have a look and see what the rest of that paragraph says, it says the residual dynamic pressure at the fittings shall not vary by more than 20%. Now if we put that into English, what it is telling us, we've got to have a look at our pipe sizing, the length of the pipes, all that type of thing, so that our flow pressure at the end does not vary by more than 20%. So we could have a short cold water supply pipe because it's coming from directly outside into the bathroom of the kitchen. The hot water pipe has got to go all the way across to the geyser, go flow through the geyser and then all the way back again. A lot more friction loss is happening. So it could be that your flow pressure there could vary by more than 20%. Then it continues to say to us that this requires that the layout and the pipe sizes shall be correctly calculated in terms of SANS 10252.1. We have had that as a topic before. Maybe we can revisit it in the future sometimes. But if you have a look at your copy of SANS 10252.1, it gives you your flow charts in the back and you can actually go and calculate what your friction losses are going to be through the different sections of the pipe system to make sure that your dynamic pressure is not going to vary by more than that 20%. The next 
The next item that we look at is 4.3.1.2, and it goes about the maintenance, replacement, or repair. So now you come to a Giza installation, and it does not comply. So you give the homeowner a written quote, you fix it and everything, and he says, no, I want you to just fix that valve that's faulty or whatever is faulty. Leave it as is. I don't have money now. What do we do? We have to issue a non-compliance. It says any non-compliance shall be reported to the owner in writing by the person who carries out the maintenance, replacement or repair. So on the screen, I've just taken a little screenshot of the non-compliance certificate that's available from the Institute of Plumbing on their website. It's very easy to download and to use. It's got a nice checklist so that it helps you remember which parts to look at and everything. And then any crosses on there, anything that does not comply is a non-compliance and you give that to the homeowner in writing. It then carries on to say that the rated pressure of the system shall not exceed a static pressure of 600 kPa. And that the expansion relief and pressure control valves used in the system shall have the same or lower pressure rating than the geezer. So that is something that we've been used to. If it's a 600 kPa geezer, we could put a 400 kPa pressure control valve on there. And we used to say, okay, the TP valve must also then change to a 400 kPa. And we'll note at the end of that paragraph, it says the TP valve and drain valve are integral parts of the storage water heater and are always supplied with or fitted to the storage water heater as required by SANS uh, 60335 part 2 part 21. So we're not allowed to change the pressure rating on the TP valve. That must stay the same as the geezer came out with. We can change. We can put a 400 or 200 or even 100 if you so wished. Pressure reducing valve and expansion valve combination. Those two must be the same, but the TP valve has to remain the same pressure and the type that it came out with on the geezer. Then when we started with the alternate energy and we started looking at heat pumps and so forth, there were lots of funny little designs and solution pipes and all sorts of things that came out that we did to make this work. But if we have a look at 4.3.5, it now tells us when flow and return circulation pipes are connected to the water heater to and from heat pumps, the safety, performance and warranty of the water heater shall not be compromised by modifying the water heater. So we're not allowed to change anything on the geezer. So any connection between the heat pump and the geezer has to be external, outside of the geezer. And there are ways that that can be done with diverter valves and things like that, and it works very well. Just keep in mind there, you're not allowed to change or modify the geezer at all. And because a heat pump is connected to the geezer. As soon as you're doing a heat pump installation, you also need to COC that. Same as with a solar. Now, what size geezer do we design for a house? Now, it tells us in 5.11.2 that storage water heaters shall be sized to user requirements in compliance with SANS 10252, and there it gives us a whole guide line as to what size the geezer should be, and shall not be of excessive capacity in relation to the usage patterns and requirements. And it also carries on that the temperature should be kept as low as possible, obviously for safety reasons, but it should be set at approximately 60 degrees Celsius. We know that if we go too low, then we have problems with Legionella and things like that. So around about 60, 65 degrees should be a good temperature. This would also mean that we have to uh, limit the size of our dead legs because in point four there it says the hot water distribution shall be designed in such a way that hot water appears quickly at the taps when opened. To this end, 
dead legs shall be designed to be as short as possible in compliance with SANS. So instead of having one geezer supplying two or three maybe areas, it may be better for us to resize that geezer and to put a smaller geezer at each one of those areas of the installation. That would then help us to keep our dead legs as short as possible and it is just more practical also. So, the next one we're looking at there is the mains shut off control. We used to have one big valve for like a whole townhouse section or a block of flats. It now says that a specific isolating valve shall be provided where the pipe enters any building or any portion of the building in separate occupation. So, each unit must have its own isolating valve. And you can see on the picture at the bottom there, there's a pressure reducing valve with an integral shut off. It says, whatever isolating control valve is installed in the system, it shall not be intended to replace a separate isolating valve required in 5.6.2. And there it says in point two that that valve, that shut off valve, that's part of the pressure control valve, is not allowed to replace your specific isolating valve. So if you put a valve like that in, nothing wrong with it, but just remember you need to have a specific isolating valve before that, so that if you need to replace that valve, you can still isolate the whole installation and remove that valve. Discharge of T valve pipes and expansion valves, there's a whole long list of 10 different items we have to keep in mind, but one that a lot of people fail on is the length of this pipe. And it tells us that the size of the pipe must be the same size as the connections. So your T V valve is normally 22 millimeter, or it's actually always 22 millimeter, and it must not have a run exceeding four meters. If you need to go bigger than four meters, the size must be increased, and not just after four meters increase it. It must be increased right from the valve. So you would come out with 22, immediately step it up to a 28 millimeter, and then you can go nine meters long. <clears throat> now, what type of elbows and bends are you allowed on there? It tells us there that you're only allowed three bends, and that all bends shall be a maximum of 45 degrees or formed with a center line radius of at least five times the diameter of drain pipe. So if you are doing a uh, soft drawn copper pipe or 460 class 2 installation where you can actually use a pipe bender, you can bend it, but it must be at least five times the diameter of the pipe or otherwise you would have to use 45 degree Bends. We're not allowed to use any elbows, so it must be a long radius there. Then your vacuum control valves, vacuum breakers as we know them, it says that there has to be one on the hot and the cold. Now what do we do if we cannot have a 300 riser because it's a flat roof or something like that? Well, it tells us here that when installed at a distance of more than 700 millimeters from the outlet of the water heater, your vacuum control valve may be teed directly into the hot water supply line. Remember, your SANS legislation is a minimum standard. Your manufacturer that supplies these bits of equipment can add to it and there are some of them that insist that even if you do take a 700 away you still have to have a riser of 150 to 100 whatever they specify on there so be very cognitive of it that whatever you are doing you have to look at the sands as your minimum standard but then also have a look at your manufacturer's specification when it comes to the vacuum breakers there That has brought me to the end of the points that I'm going to highlight in this morning session. If anybody wants to contact me directly, you have got my contact details on screen at the moment. And I will hand back to Sean and we can have a look and see what questions there are.
Right, perfect, Patrick. Um, we do have a couple of questions, so let's get right into it. Uh, the first of which re we reads, I have a very old client in an old house. The geyser needs to be replaced, but the system is not balanced. The only place where the water is mixed is in the shower. Can I only balance the shower to avoid unnecessary costs? Correct, yes. If it's difficult to uh, balance the whole house's installation, you can actually put another pressure reducing valve with the same pressure rating as it is for the hot water system and then just drop your cold water for that mixing point. The rest of the house does not need to have balanced water pressure then. Right, perfect. And the next question reads here, did you say that, that in the process of quoting a residential dwelling, drawing with the form of a mechanical engineer is needed? showing hot and cold reticulation on the drawing. Correct. SANS 10252 now asks for a um, signed off drawing for your pipe reticulation design for all these buildings. All right, perfect. The next question here reads, what does, what do, uh, excuse me, reads, how do we make a very cold unbalanced house balanced? Can we put in an additional PRV at the water meter? Okay, yes, you can put a uh, pressure reducing valve at the water meter. Just remember that you want to have your pressure reducing valve as close to the terminal point as possible so that you don't drop your pressure of the system and then you still lose a lot to friction losses and so forth later. So, uh, if you have got a large house with multiple entries, it could be better maybe to put separate pressure reducing valves like I suggested just now at the different points, all of the same rating. I wouldn't put it at the water meter due to the fact that then all your garden taps and so forth are going to be reduced pressure also and you want your high pressure there. So it would be better to do it after any of your garden taps comes off the line. Right, perfect. The next question here reads, just to confirm the SANS standards temperature setting is 60 degrees Celsius. Okay, that is a recommended setting. Uh, in SANS it does tell us that you're not allowed to dispense water at a terminal point of over 50, I think it's 58 degrees Celsius, I speak under correction now. So, um, yes, if you have got a very short piece between your terminal point and your geyser, there's not going to be much of a thermal lag between the two. You could drop it down to 58, but the, yes, the recommended temperature is 60 degrees Celsius. Right, perfect. Then, yeah, we have got a couple more questions, a little bit more off topic, um, but the first ridge reads, why do Archer and CIA not insist on a COC for a geyser installation? Okay, I think that we're going to need to take up with them. They should be insisting on a COC, anything, any work that's been done on a Giza installation. All right, perfect. And then the final question I've got here reads, can we write on a COC non-compliant part? For example, existing Giza moving with no lagging due to owner not wanting lagging. Okay, we must remember that a new installation, you cannot do a non-compliance. Any new installations have got to comply completely from the beginning. But as I said, when we came to that point, if you come to an installation that does not comply, by law, you have to notify the owner of non-compliance. So, yes, on your COC uh, that you're submitting to PERB, you will then attach a copy of the non-compliance that you issued the owner. Right, and then a uh, last question has popped up here. It reads, what do I need to do if builders do not use qualified plumbers to do the work? Do I have to report them and how? The best bet would be to report them to um, IOPSA and then they will help us then again to go via the relevant authorities and so forth to do inspections and to force uh, the use of qualified plumbers that give COCs and so forth. Right, perfect. Well, that is all of the questions we have got here for this morning. Uh, would you like to end off, Patrick? 
thank you very much everybody once again for your attention and the questions it shows that there's a big interest in this topic as i said my details are on screen if you have any further questions or need of help by all means drop me a mail or phone me and if i cannot help you immediately i will get the right answers to you thank you very much again all right perfect thanks so much for joining us this morning guys i'm gonna go ahead and end the session off now um Please remember the survey on the way out and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.